I always say that I can teach you everything. All the skills, I'll bring experts that will teach you everything if you need it. But there is only one thing that I cannot teach you. It's ambition. If you don't want to make it in this life, if you're just jumping this company to have, you know, like a safe job and so on, this is not the right company for you. You're listening to The Pivotal Leader, where modern leaders talk about the moments that shifted their organizational cultures and pivoted their teams to success. Hey, everyone. This is Gita Tremarco, Chief Results Officer of Pivot 10 Results, a strategy and training company that helps businesses shift from people problems to performance results. Each week on The Pivotal Leader, I feature inspirational leaders who know how to positively impact their customers, employees, and brand through culture building. In this episode of The Pivotal Leader, I interviewed Neza Aloui, founder and president of Mayshed Foundation. Neza is a global advocate for change. She's an international entrepreneur working in sustainability, philanthropy, wellness, business, media, and fashion. She backs her Be Who You Want to Be philosophy with action and tireless advocacy. Neza is also the creative director of her luxury handbag brand, Maison Mayshed, where she designs limited collections of handbags using recognized processes of the art world, including serial numbers, limited production, and auction sales. Through her missions for the United States in Mozambique, Ethiopia, Senegal, Mauritania, and Haiti, she has developed a special understanding and close relationships with marginalized communities, especially youth and women in the third world. These experiences inspired her to create the Mayshed Shed Foundation in 2014. She also founded the Mayshed Women Club, a business-oriented networking club featuring workshops and panels, which gathers business and community leaders from around the world to create a lobbying force that supports the Mayshed Foundation's Be Who You Want to Be philosophy. Nessa has also earned numerous rewards for her work, including Positive Luxuries Butterfly Mark in recognition of her socially responsible approach to craftsmanship, design, customer service, and social responsibility surrounding her Maison Mayshed brand in 2015. In 2016, she was recognized by the All Ladies League and Women Economic Forum as an iconic woman creating a better world for all. And she's also published several books, including 2012's Moroccan Sahara, Ground of Inspiration Photography Book, and 2015's Women Secrets of the Moroccan Sahara, released through Mayshad. Additionally, as editor-in-chief of Mayshed Woman Magazine, Aneza reaches women across the globe with her philosophy. The magazine writes about empowering experiences through its sections on mind and soul, travel, beauty and health, art and design, fashion and cooking. So let's jump into this episode of The Pivotal Leader and learn from Neza Aloui. Welcome, Neza, to The Pivotal Leader today. Hi, Gina. I'm so proud to be participating today to this podcast and be able to share my experience with your audience. Oh, great. And I'm happy that you're on U.S. soil while we're recording this. Uh, we were kind of going back and forth with scheduling, but you actually live in, do you live in, well, where do you live? Paris, Africa? I know you're from Africa, but tell us a little bit <laughs> about that. <laughs> So, yeah, that's a question that I get a lot. And to be honest, you know, like sometimes I question myself because I move so much. (laughs) But I have two daughters that go to the American school in Rabat, the capital of Morocco. So Uh I guess I'm living there. Okay. (laughs) But um, I also have offices in Paris and New York. So I travel a lot. Okay. And right now, while I'm talking to you, I'm in the middle of Utah. And I'm having a sunrise walk. And so... uh, I'm happy to also share the energy of this momentum that I'm living here. Oh, that's great. That's awesome. So we're getting some of that energy from your walk. And I'm a big believer (laughs) in walking and having meetings. I think it just really kind of opens (laughs) opens your brain up because you're you're moving and the endorphins are going. So that this should be really good today. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, you have this diverse background as an international entrepreneur, which got me really excited. And you work in sustainability and philanthropy and wellness and business and media and fashion. And I don't even know where to begin to start, but let's talk a little bit about who Neza is and, and how you got your business and your foundation started simultaneously, which, you know, we talked about earlier, doesn't always happen right away to have that give back and business component all at the same time. So could you give our listeners a little bit of a a snapshot of who you are and who your company is? I created Mayshad from the first syllabus of the names of my daughters, Maysoon and Shadin, in 2011. 
I was a 29 years old mom of two that I had uh, pretty young. And I had a first part of my life where I created an import-export business between America and Morocco. And I wanted to reinvent myself by creating something that was really dear to my heart, a company that would have the creativity part, that would spread a message of positivity, and uh, that would have the philanthropic aspect. So that was very challenging because when I would sit with communication companies or accountants and so on, they would tell me, you just can't do it all at the same time. You have to choose. <laughs> You're either an artist or an entrepreneur. It's not the same concept or a philanthropist, okay? <laughs> but uh, you can't have it all in the same company and be successful. So it was a challenge, you know, and it's a challenge that we all face when we try to make innovative choices in our lives. <laughs> You know, sometimes people that care about us will kind of discourage us because there is always a risk in creating something that is innovative. But then when you look at the stories of all the great leaders of this world, they had to take a risk. This is how you create something that is really new, that is outstanding, and that can get big. So this is how I decided to create Meshad. And now we're in 2018, heading to 2018. I am just so happy that I made these choices because I built a company that has a soul where whether our clients or our team members, they are so happy to feel that they're making a difference by participating into the development of Meshad. I like that you did that from the very beginning. One of the reasons why I started this podcast was about talking about company culture and core values and purpose. And when you have those things in place, you're going to be able to attract the best team members and retain the best team members. And because you started the company with all of that in place of like, we want to have this purpose and we want to, we want to have this impact I'm guessing that it was easy to get people to jump on board. Well, it's never really easy, but it was probably easier to get people to want to be part of your team. Well, you definitely have the people that jump on board for the right reasons. And I always said that. I said, I don't want people that get in my company for the salary. So the way I do it is I usually card their salary at maybe 20% less than the market value for the first two, three months. And then they have that ability to just jump and develop uh, their salaries and, and job position very fast in my company because it's a startup. And I always say that I can teach you everything, everything, you know, like all the skills. I'll bring experts that will teach you everything if you need it. But there is only one thing that I cannot teach you. It's ambition. If you don't want to make it in this life, if you're just jumping this company to have, you know, like a safe job and so on, this is not the right company for you because we're all hardworking, passionate about what we're doing. And and we have a global vision that we want to succeed because it's beyond succeeding for us, it's succeeding for the world and tomorrow's generation. So uh, when you have those words, you know, it can, I, I had some honest, you know, people that just told me, you know what, this is so fabulous that I, I don't want to screw this for you. I'm, I'm not at that stage of my life. And then they backed up. And I respected that that yeah. much, you know, like very much. That's pretty awesome when people can have that self-awareness to know it's not the right thing. If we could all be that honest, I think sometimes we're not. So that's great to hear. I think that when they see how, how much you involve yourself into your own company, then they understand that it's not only my company, it's my children's company, it's all these families that live with it. So it kind of uh, gives them that sense of responsibility and awareness. Let's talk a little bit about the Mayshed lifestyle. Can you tell us more about the Mayshed lifestyle and what that brand is? And you said something that got me really interested of how it ties in with boutique hotels. So can you tell us about your brand? My brand really started with positivity. And since I remember myself, you know, as a child, I I always was passionate about the human mind and trying to understand what is the secret of happiness. So (laughs) I used to 
sit down with my friends in high school and, you know, how they would write on their, like, desk, I love uh, Brian forever. And I'm like, how do you do it? <laughs> how do you know that? Like, how do you know where you're going to be in 10 years and chill? You know, I was like a 13 years old girl that was so grounded in the present moment. So back then, I didn't read all those books that came up in my 20s about the power of the present moment and so on. But I was already exploring those values, you know. So I am here, the present. I cannot really project myself that far. And, and so there was that part. And then the second part was about happiness being a choice. You know, it's, you need to, to wake up and, and choose to be happy. And when you make that choice, then a lot of positive things come to your mind. And then to, to your life, I mean. And so I grew up, you know, like at 18, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. But I knew that I wanted to travel the world. So I went into a hotel management school which brings me back to now using those uh, fabulous skills that I'm using in my uh, business. And the most important part was traveling and discovering the other cultures. While I was discovering the other cultures and living in different parts, I lived in Canada, Toronto, I lived in London, I lived in Spain, Marbella, in Paris, Italy, I started seeing the difference of the cultures, but also the commonality of that happiness point. We have common values, whether in Africa, India, from all religions, you know, all religions are seeking and the same thing, okay? How to bring us to that state of contentment, of happiness, of gratefulness and awareness. So then, you know, I started picking up these common values and uh, applying them to my life. And I got to a point where I wanted to share that. That's when I built the business and I started creating the Meshad lifestyle. So, and it would be a lifestyle that is contemporary, that works for, for the new generations. We're all in movement, you know? We used, back then, a hundred years ago, we used to live and grow up in a village. And uh, life was much more easier, maybe, in terms of relationships, in terms of a lot of things and even developing a business, you know, you just developed whatever, you know, like your father was doing. He was a pharmacist and you became a pharmacist. There was a lot of existential issues that we didn't ask ourselves back then because the world was small, small in a way that we lived in a superficie of, of wherever we were born. And now that the world has expanded with all these modern tools like transportation, connectivity, and so on, it's great for some people that know how to take advantage of it, like me, for instance, you know, like traveling from one place to another in the same day and being able to develop my business. But a lot of people got lost in this development. A lot of people are suffering from identity crisis. They don't know who they are anymore. Yeah. They don't know what are they supposed to do. You know, too much choice kills the choice. So I really felt that need to develop a lifestyle guidance through a business, through, we also have the Meshad Mag. So uh, we also publish articles of uh, other people that have guidance to share and so on. And so I felt that I wanted to create a sort of universal language. And you do that through your luxury handbags, partly. I do that through exactly, you know, with the message, be who you want to be, that is on the handbags. And why did I want to do that? It's because I was also lucky to explore luxurious brands at an early age. And then I started kind of like running away from it because all the luxurious brands that we know that became like over distributed and became, you know, you also see some people that suffer from not having like blah, blah, whatever handbag or, right. or whatever watch or stuff like that. And I think it's so, it's so sad, you know, it's so sad to get to this point and to when fashion, when you start becoming a, a fashion victim. So I wanted to create a brand that would not place women in that category, that it's a small brand. It's very 
qualitative in terms of the, the luxurious process and everything, but it's not a brand that you would recognize like the other brands. So I felt that the women that would come to it are women that want to carry luxury, but that don't want to be associated to all the other brands. And they would go towards a brand that also has the philanthropic side of it. And that carries a message, you know, be who you want to be. For me, it's, it's a message of choosing who you want to be and create it, but also inspiring others to, to follow their inner voice. You know, I have flashbacks, and this is really interesting. I have flashbacks to my teenage years when I went to an all-girls high school, and I was fortunate enough that my parents, even though they didn't have a lot of money, they could put me through a private school to give me the best education. But I went to school with a lot of girls who had a lot of money, you know, who came from rich families, but I did not. And they all had Louis Vuitton purses. And growing up and and seeing all of that, the impact it can have on you as a teenage girl of wanting to feel included and part of it. And many, many years later, actually only a couple years ago, I bought that purse because it was more of a psychological, emotional thing than anything else. It wasn't because I wanted it the brand, you know, it was because I wanted to fulfill that childhood wound that I had. What I love about what you're doing, be who you want to be is you're saying, hey, and and now I'm at a point in my life where I'm like, I don't need to be associated with an expensive brand. I would rather be the brand. I would, you know what I mean? Like, Totally. You know, so I don't I don't need that at this stage in my life because, again, you made reference to people, you know, are having these identity crises of not knowing who they are. And I think when you get to a place of really knowing who you are and someone is giving you permission to be who you want to be, it doesn't really matter. You can do whatever you totally. want. Totally. And th- this, is, this is really where I want to be able to take people, to inspire them, to take that way because... I was lucky to be able to explore all this world. And I can tell you that on top of that chain, you have people that are very sad because when they start just collecting material stuff, it never ends. You know, it's like they want to get this thing, they, they this get home bag, and once you have it, that satisfaction is gone yeah. because it's just a fake materialistic external right. tool that will not come and fulfill your inner soul. And so you get into the wrong competition because that competition never ends. Yeah. And this seems so much more liberating. So how does this connect to, how do you connect this in creating an experience through hotels and, and where, uh, where can people find your handbag? So the handbags are online on the website meshacollection.com and uh, they are in our showroom in Paris. And through the experience, so the experience is all about the five senses. The Meshat experience is that awareness of living a moment where you taste something good, but you also have the perfect music around, the perfect smell around, with this entire cozy experience that makes it unique and memorable. So this is what I try to create in my spaces. Oh, that sounds really interesting. So does that, you can experience that in your showroom in Paris, but also you have a boutique Exactly. Hotel. So in different hotels. Exactly. So someone is in Paris, there is Appartement Menchad, where they can go and they will be received by Nadia, who's our manager over there, that will receive them in a five senses moment. And it's, it's all about generosity. You know, you don't go to buy something, you go to to experience the Meshad spirit, you know, so you you get out of it with an inspiration with, you know, I always tell my team to always be super helpful in and out of the box, you know, whether they need an address in Paris or they need some advisors, I want people to be able to go to that address and, and feel home. And so then after opening Paris, I worked on this project in Rabat, so it's the city where I grew up, the capital of Morocco, which is an old home from the 18th century that I restored into a a boutique hotel with three bedrooms where uh, they serve breakfast, lunch, and dinners. 
and we can actually stay and have a you know two three days program with a cultural tour of the city, yoga classes, and so on. And now I'm working on a third project, which is in Marrakech. Marrakech is this fantastic city in the south of Morocco, and it's going to be on a 12 acres estate and will have 20 suites. And of course, with all the farming part and so on, that will be included in the project. Well, that sounds really fascinating. Where can we find more information about these, these projects and these hotels? So the, the hotel is going to be the website Meshad Experience that uh, will be launched in two weeks and will have all these destinations. Oh, wow. But, but also, everyone can follow me on my Instagram. It's Meshad Women. And it's like live pictures of wherever I am in the world. And I'm really, really sharing every positive detail of the development of my life, you know, from being a mother of two and having to travel to develop my business, but also following me through the different aspects of my life, which is like a social trip to Africa or uh, being in the middle of Utah right now, experiencing uh, a quiet time. And then like a more fashion time in New York and Paris. So that's on my Instagram, Meshad Women. Okay. W-O-M-A-M. And we'll share all of that in the, I do have most of your stuff. So I'm going to share that in our show notes so that when people listen to the podcast, they can also pull up all the notes and find all the different, all the different links, which will also share the podcast to your social links. So you'll, you'll see that as soon as the podcast goes up. So let's talk a little bit about, it's, it's hard to be an entrepreneur, number one. I think it's even a little more challenging to be a, a woman entrepreneur. And then you add to it, you're a woman who who is from Africa and, and grew up in an Arab world. And, and so that's a whole nother set of challenges that go along with that. So my first question is, where did you get help to get your business off the ground? You, you had this vision and this dream and you sound pretty smart, like you could do it all. But I think sometimes the smartest people are the ones who get help from other people. Yes, help is an important part that's you should never stop uh, reaching out to. And coming from North Africa and Morocco and having found the father of my kids uh, in high school and getting married at 23, having my children and done by 27, you know, the society can kind of expect you to stop there. You know, that's it. You have it all. Right. <laughs> you have the husband, you have the kids, you know, you have the successful business because I started developing, um, as I said at the beginning, um, importing American brands in uh, Morocco. But um, as I also said, for me, being able to do all that very fast, because I always put a lot of focus in whatever I decided to do, and I tend to do it fast. The, that part, it's about just like doing it every single day, <laughs> holidays, weekends, you know, just doing it, you know, like you have a goal and with that goal, you're going to have struggle, you're going to have obstacles and you shouldn't get discouraged by that because the more obstacles you get and the more it means that you're getting close to your goal. And because if you're doing something that is not really special and meaningful, then you don't have any obstacle because you're not achieving any greatness. So the obstacles come with how high is your ambition regarding your vision and so on. So to get back into my life, when, when I realized that I had that capacity to build what the society wants us as a successful person, then I totally reconsidered everything. And I said, okay, if I could do it once, I need to do it twice. But I need to deconstruct everything to really build it from scratch. And there, I'm going to have something to be able to share with others. So then people around you think that you're going through a phase, that uh, you're probably going through depression or something, <laughs> and because they don't understand, like, why on earth would you do that? <laughs> but for me, it was very important to do it so that I could really pass on a bigger message. And so getting back to your question, how do you do it to build a business? It starts with first finding out 
a project that really fits your personality. It's very important. Some people are not morning people. Some people are not travelers. Some people need to travel. We all, by our adult time, mid-20s, we start knowing who we are. And we can't live and succeed on the dreams of others. It's not because my best friend succeeded in something that I'm going to be like, hey, I'm going to do that thing and I'm going to succeed. No, my best friend succeeded in that thing because my best friend found that project that fits him or her. Right. So it's very important to understand who we are. What is the lifestyle that we want? And I go and I speak in universities to students who are on the verge of having their bachelor. And I tell them, what do you want to do? And they say, oh, I want to be, I studied law school, I want to be a lawyer. I say, but where do you see yourself in five years? Which city? What kind of lawyer? Do you see yourself waking up every day and going to court? Do you see yourself traveling the world and being more like on international law? What is the lifestyle? Describe to me the perfect day that you want. And that day that you're going to repeat again and again and again and again for the rest of your life because it's that consistency that will take you to being a successful person. What is that day that your gut can take over and over? And so when you get into the details of what is your perfect fit and lifestyle, that's when you can start shaping your project and your vision. Through that process, where did you get support and help? You know, it's your, especially because you're, you're producing a product, right? You're, you have to yeah. design it and manufacture it and find money for that and then put it in a showroom and get it. And, and especially as artists, you know, there are um, a lot of artists who produce things, don't always know where to go to get that help. So who have been some of the people that have helped you along the way, whether it was... Well, first of all, yeah, I understood who I was as an entrepreneur and I'm a creator and I am a developer, but I am not a salesperson and I am not an expert in the different fields that I'm going to develop. You understand? Right. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so sometimes wanting to do it all on our own, that's when we fail it. So when I understood that my capacity was as a creative director, then I, I started going into experts, for instance, in, in the, the handbag. I'm not a handbag designer. You know, it takes studies. It takes experience. So I have Julia, who is a permanent consultant for us, who has 30 years experience in the luxury handbag industry. And she's the one that... I put in between my, you know, like uh, own designs that I will draw in, in a paper and she will turn them into technical sheets. She will go and speak to, to the production uh, unit that will not speak to me because who am I? I am not Coco Chanel, you know, <laughs> so they will speak to Julia because they have known Julia for 30 years and Julia worked for all these big brands, so they trust her. And so when you do that, when you put experts at a point of your business where you know that you're not good at it, then it really helps with the process. Then the second part is have friends that now call me because they want advice on their business. And so they ask me a question, oh, which name do you think I should give to my company, this one or this one? (laughs) And I say, look, (laughs) it is not about the name. I mean, who thought that Kentucky Fried Chicken (laughs) would be such, you know, like a successful business. It's not about the name. The name, it's like you're naming your child. It's not the name that you're going to give to your child that's going to make him successful. It's how much, you know, how you're going to raise that child and how much, you know, like values and energy and so on you're going to put in it. So the name needs to be a name that you can carry for the rest of your life. You know, you're the one who's going to call your son or daughter you like the most. So it's the same with your business. You need to choose a name that you love and that you can explain the story of why you called it that name. Yeah, and I I think what becomes interesting um, when people do start businesses and they get they get caught up on the name and they get caught up on the logo and they they get caught up on those little things. And I call them little because back to what you're saying, what's most important important is what is your purpose and what is your why behind your company of of what you're, you know, why are you doing what you're doing? 
and let that name piece of it come later. It doesn't have to come immediately. People, you know, often are like, I got an idea for a great name. Doesn't really matter if there's nothing to back it up. Yeah. And, and, you know, and especially like at the beginning as well, you need to kind of like not take too many advices because every time you sit with a different person, they will direct you in a different way. And then you're not really advancing in any way. You need to choose. I'm telling you this advice, they're really dear to my heart because they're different to what you're going to learn in a marketing book or in a right. business development book. They're related to my own personal experience. And trust me, at some point, when you're really, really, you know, like at that verge of developing your business, you need to stop, you know, your social life for a while, or at least not talk about your business socially, because otherwise you get lost. Because you're all doubtful about your ideas and so on. And so if you go too soon into a communication company that will try to to brand and shape your message, then what they'll do is just shape it the way it had been shaped for like thousand businesses. So you need to really make it unique and that uniqueness will come from you. Mm-hmm. and will come from and so yeah that moment is very important i'm going to tell you an anecdote it's, it's like a little story that <laughs> i just love and it's the story of this it's a race of frogs in a mountain and you have all the supporters that are just screaming oh my god the poor little frogs how are they gonna make it and so the little frogs are are going and racing and and you know it's like a very tough path and so most of the frogs fall and, and the supporters are, oh my God, they will never make it. Poor little frogs, poor little frogs. And then there is three frogs that make it and two and one that finally makes it. Okay. And then the journalists and the reporters go to the little frog and ask her, oh my God, how did you make it? And then they found out that that little frog was deaf. And that's why she was not hearing all the fear and discouragement of the supporters. That's why she could make it, you know? And I think it's such a nice story because it's also the story of my life. When I decided to reshape my life and I also went through a divorce and and decided to create my child with all these things, you know, today, every person from the father of my kids to my parents, all the people that thought that I was oh my god what is she doing <laughs> are not now respecting me and and you know like loving my business they're part of it with this all recomposed happy family but back then they were all fearing my choices yeah. and and so sometimes you need to be that little frog who can't hear because if you keep hearing discouragement every day then you will fail <laughs> it plays on on your psychology it plays on your vibes on your energy on everything i've seen that happen over the years with me as well you know when i started my first business actually my second business my i i also own an improv comedy theater and i i started it thank you and i started it and a lot of people said to me it's not going to work that'll never you know that's not going to work here and why are you doing that and they would make funny references to it how's that little improv theater of yours and oh, then a couple of years later, people started saying, wow, that, uh, boy, that business is really, boy, you're, you're still in business. Oh, it's still, it's still working. Oh. And then you watch it continue to grow and people get to know who you are and uh, you start to elevate and, you know, you really have to tune out the noise, not just when, you know, when I started my business, that happened, but even throughout my career in the past few years, as I've grown into creating other businesses I would start hearing that, what I call the noise, people saying, you know what you really should do? You should really do this and you should really do that. And that, I wouldn't do that if I were you. And you should be careful what you say on social media. And I finally had to get to a point where I had to ignore everybody. You have to. You have to because you also need to have compassion for these people. These people are the supporters. What's the difference between the supporters on the side and the, the people in the race? is that the supporters will never have the guts to be in the race. Right. So they don't understand what is going on in the race. So that, that's the first thing. Then the second thing is that they have time to come and criticize your business and put that fear in you because they are not 
into something that takes them as much energy and passion as what you're doing. And as a leader, you know, as the world leader, you need to lead the path. You need to believe you're the first one that needs to believe in your project and your life. And you need to take yourself seriously. And this is how you influence others to start taking you seriously. And this is what opens a lot of doors afterwards. Another advice that I would like to give is you reach out to help experts and so on. But you also should not be afraid to go and knock at big doors to ask for help. Now, when you go in there, I don't know, like for instance, whether you, Gina, want to do an interview to this like massive star or whatever, then, you know, you know how you have some people, they'll be like, yeah, you know, I can never get that person. I can never get this. I can never. I have a friend in Paris. She, she launched a magazine called Winners and she was not known at all. And it was her first issue. And she went and contacted Bill Gates and she had Bill Gates on the cover of her first issue magazine. And, and he invited her to come over and had, have the interview in in his home with his wife for two, three days. So that really, really launched her business. But if she was the type of person that would think, my God, I'm launching a business. I cannot have, you know, like Bill Gates. I'm not even going to think about it. And then of course, you're not going to have Bill Gates, you know? So you need to think big and especially you need to come with a true story. And when you get at that level of Bill Gates and all the successful entrepreneurs, you have a lot of compassion for people that are starting with a big aim, with a big devotion to their business. And and you respect that. And sometimes what is going to be, you know, an interview on Forbes or those big magazines for Bill Gates is just, you know, like an extra interview. But to be able to help someone that, thought of launching a magazine called Winners. And that's something that I think would speak more to him than, than just being in one of those, you know, like already successful magazines. Right, right. And I think someone like that's going to also appreciate that someone trying to do what they're they're doing. Yeah. There's a lot of entrepreneurs out there who are very supportive to someone coming up, right? Like that's also part yes. of your kind yes. of you know, your give back. So let, let's talk a little bit about what it was like for you on, you know, again, the whole being kind of like in a minority position. And I bring that up because there are a lot of women out there who feel like they don't have, they don't have the the leverage or the extra leg up to get where they want to get. And, and you're, you know, female, North, North African, Arab world. And we have a lot going yeah. on in today's Not- society that especially lately with everything going on with sexual harassment, what has some of your experience been or some of your advice? And maybe tie this back to your woman club and magazine and some of the things that you're doing to help empower other women. So with the Meshad Foundation, we do social and economical development of women in Africa. So I like to help people that are already on the verge of helping themselves because you cannot save people. You can inspire them to save themselves. You can teach them how to save themselves. You can lead them, but you cannot just take people who are not like mentally ready or willing to be saved and save them because you're just assisting them. If you're giving them something, it, you know, being into a successful path wherever in the world and on whatever social class, it's an, it's about choosing to have a certain attitude, ethics, you know, waking up every morning, working. Working is is essential to anyone in the world. And so I don't like helping people who don't work and victimize themselves and say, oh, I'm poor and this and that, you know, and or beggars, you know, I, I like to help people that have that dignity to wake up and try to produce something. And so this is what the foundation is about. I chose women empowerment because I'm a woman and I thought that I could speak to women. But now I feel more that I'm on like humanity empowerment and and youth empowerment and women empowerment and, and no gender empowerment. Because there was a phase where the feminist movement in the 1960s was so essential to give a place to the women in the society for the women to be able to work and so on. But we shouldn't take it today as a gender war. Mm-hmm. The working place is all about seduction, 
jealousy. I mean, you can have other women that can be jealous of certain position that you're going to have, and they will try to break you and so on. So these things are there. And for sure, for a man to use their power to get sexual benefits from, from a woman, this is disgusting. But this is, for me, more than anything, it's a powerful person that is using their power to, to, to have sexual benefits from another person. Whether yeah. it's a woman that does it to a man or a man that does it to a woman, it is just disgusting and should be punished by law. So about all this sexual harassment movement that is coming out and, and people that are telling on it, it's good, good that people speak. But I don't want it to become like a war against men right. in the working industry because that will have a lot of consequences with time that can harm women. What about a man that has nothing to do with sexual harassment, but that fears to to um, to have a woman assistant because you know, like she might, I don't know, invent something at some point. Uh, yeah, and I think we may we're going to see some backlash on on a lot of sure. Women. You know, it's, people are going to be because, men are going to be afraid. Exactly. Exactly. You know, if, if you're if you're abusing things, and so the media tend to kind of like take an information and will sell it over and over and over again. And this is where the media should have a conscious awareness and responsibility of knowing what is the limit of passing on the message and an information. So that's my point of view on this thing. And at the same time, you also have some cases of real rape that are going on every single minute yeah. in the world and yeah. in America. And this sexual harassment thing should not cover up the reality of people that are being abused, violence, and so on. And we, we should still be talking about those things. About Rather than just talking about, yeah, you know, he asked me to do this or he asked me to do that. Well, you're a big girl. Don't do it. It's good. It's good to talk about it. It's really bad for any powerful person to use their power to, to get any sort of sexual advantages from someone else. That That is really bad. But we should also be speaking and defending and taking action um, against violence and rapes that are going on every day. Yeah, and, and getting back to your philosophy on be who you want to be, I think probably the best thing that's come out of all of this is the conversations that are happening. I think a lot of women have grown up or been raised or conditioned in this mentality sometimes that, you know, I don't want to say to play smaller, but to feel like that they can't play bigger and you've already hit it on the head about it. it's more of a human thing than a gender thing. I know growing up my entire life, while I had more opportunity and privilege than many, I still had disadvantages. I was still didn't have everything handed to me, but I never thought in the mindset of being disadvantaged. I always thought in the mindset of do whatever I need to do to put in the work to get to where I want to get in my dreams. And I never thought of myself as, okay, I'm a female or I'm a white female or I'm, like that's never really kind of played a part in it. And I think if we all got into that mindset of the human perspective versus gender, race, religion, any of those things, that we would all benefit from that mindset. I totally agree with you, Gina. I grew up in a family that could have been very conservative because it was an aristocratic family in Morocco and I was the only daughter of my father. So like all the focus was on me and I had people telling me, oh my God, you know, like he's never going to let you do anything, never going to let you study abroad, never going to let you do. And, and it's not true. I was like a little tomboy and I would sit with him and I would defy him with logic because he was a very logical man. And so, you know, you, you cannot tease everything. And yes, when I made certain choices, the, the society, and that society that I speak about is everywhere, whether you live yeah. in the Hamptons, you know, like the society is judging you, wh whether you live, you know, like in any part you, you live. And to be who you want to be and to create who you want to be, you need to kind of like not think of what people are, are going to think of you because you need to be the one one that is judging yourself every day. Every day I wake up and I'm like looking at myself in the mirror and if I'm good in my values, if I'm good in my discipline, health, lifestyle, work and everything. And so, so the same, you know, as, as a woman, as 
like an ethnic minority or what religious background and so on, this should never stop you. Because on the other hand, we have people, we have successful black people, we have successful Muslim people, we have successful women, we have... So as long as there is one that could make it, that means that you can make it too. And so there is no gender or, I mean, you meet people that, that don't, don't have legs and that are having this powerful, successful life. So how can you be, you know, like on your two feet and say, you know, oh, but I can't do it. So when you see that, you see that power is really in your mind, in, in your vision and conviction, and there is no excuse. We all are somewhere and we all can get somewhere. And it depends on how much time and energy we put in it. Well, this has been such a great podcast interview with you. I think you're so inspirational for entrepreneurs and women and humans in general. So I want to thank you for your time today to be on The Pivotal Leader. Thank you so much, Gina. And it was, you know, when you get into those fabulous interviews and talks and they're led, the way you lead them, well, it's an inspirational moment for me too. Oh, thank you. I love that. If people want to connect with you, your company, your foundation, what are some of the best ways for them to reach out and connect with you? Mayshad, M-A-Y-S-H-A-D. Mayshad Women is my Instagram where I'm reachable. Um, you know, they can PM me and I'm really reachable to everyone and I love being that way. And then you have mayshadfoundation.org, you have mayshadcollection.com and mayshadexperience.com that will be launched in two weeks. Okay, great. We're going to wrap it up if you can hang on one second. Once again, thank you to Neza for being on The Pivotal Leader today. Thank you to all of our listeners who have listened in. You can find show notes for this episode, including contact information for Neza on all of her foundations and social media and website. And I'll have all that in the show notes for you at thepivotalleader.com. The Pivotal Leader is a production of Pivot 10 Results, a strategy and training company that helps businesses shift from people problems to performance results. Remember, you can find our podcast on iTunes. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please leave a rating and review. And don't forget to email me any questions about employee engagement or customer acquisition at Gina at pivot10.com. And I'll answer those in upcoming episodes, or I'll just send you an email and answer them. And until next time, if you're feeling stuck in your business, it's probably time to pivot. You've been listening to The Pivotal Leader. To learn more about how to shift your culture and pivot to success, visit pivot10results.com. That's pivot10results.com.